Hello, everybody. I'm Dan Forbes, host of the League with Giants tweet chat, which we just finished on Twitter. And now we've come over to Blab so that we can see each other and continue the conversation with a little more than 140 characters. And my uh, guest host tonight uh, on the League with Giants tweet chat was is uh, David Dye. So, David, introduce yourself uh, to us here on Blab. Well, hello, and uh, we've got people from all over the world there in the tweet chat, so probably here as well. So good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever it might be for you. Right. Uh, so my name's David, and uh, I work with leaders, managers, supervisors who want to uh, get their team to the top without losing their soul or their mind in the process. And do that in a lot of different ways. Do keynote speaking and training, uh, leadership coaching, consulting, and so forth. Great, thank you. Um, I miss my mind. Is all is all I can say. Uh, <laughs> so it's interesting that you describe it that way. So uh, uh, Scott, Daniel, um, uh, Raven, anyone else like to take a seat, and we'll get our discussion going here. So we on the tweet chat we were talking about metrics madness. Um, what made you come up with that topic as a suggestion, and how does that relate to the work that you do, David? Well, sure. The uh, uh, Actually, the, the topic came from the third chapter of a new book that I have coming out in April and uh, co-written with Karen Hurt from Let's Grow Leaders. And when we were discussing what it means for a leader, for a manager to lose their soul, uh, the uh, one of the ideas that kept percolating up was that in today's data-driven economy, measurement is important. It's not going away. And everybody in the tweet chat started with that acknowledgement that Leaders define what success looks like and how we're going to get there. And yet there's a trap. And that trap is that when we focus on the measurement to the exclusion of the people and we don't have a good, healthy balance, uh, we end up losing our soul, getting frustrated, bitter, losing our connection with the people. Uh, you can get into the, the gaming of systems as opposed to playing the game like we were talking about in the tweet chat. All those sorts of things happen. So that's what uh, prompted the, the idea for tonight's tweet chat. Okay. Yep. Thanks for that. I'm going to change the topic here. Notice uh, it's one of the questions that we uh, that we put out in the tweet chat, and that is how important are metrics? Mm -hmm. So, going from a solopreneur up to you know the largest companies in the world, how important is is, is even metrics uh, for even the solopreneur up to uh, up to those large companies? Mm -hmm. At, at a fundamental level, it's got to be important, right? If you don't know what you're doing, if you don't know what success looks like, if you don't know what determines if you're successful, you have absolutely no way to know if you're going the right direction. So at the most fundamental level, feedback is a sign that if you're driving down the highway and you mean to be going to Toledo and it tells you that uh, Dallas is, you know, a couple hundred miles that way, you know you're going the wrong direction, at least if you're from my neck of the woods in the middle of the country. Uh, and so that's measurement. And so measurement is very, very important to have some idea of where you're going and how you know if you've gotten there. Yep. I, uh, I, I love that answer. And uh, having a roadmap or using a roadmap or GPS and having mm -hmm. milestones uh, along the way uh, helps, <laughs> helps me to get uh, uh, to where I need to go. Yeah, I love so, that you use the roadmap analogy when, uh, you know, some of our younger viewers. <laughs> what's that? Yeah, right? What's a road? What's a roadmap? And you know, the I world is changing. I don't have a paper roadmap either. I always hated those things because I never could fold them. And get I tell them you, I, I still have an atlas, a paper atlas in, in my SUV because every once in a while I'm, I'm out of cell phone reception. So got to have that back up. Okay. So uh, here's, here's, here's another question that we had. Uh, by the way, if anyone would like to take one of the open seats and join us here as we have some uh, continued discussion from the uh, uh, League with Giants tweet chat, feel free to do so. Here comes, uh, here comes Scott. Hey Scott. hey, Scott. Good to see you. Hey, good to see you guys. David, thanks for sharing. Yeah, absolutely. Welcome. Glad you could be here. Dad. So, Scott, did you jump in with a with a thought you wanted to share or just to join the conversation? You know, it, was, um, it goes back to when I was running a, an agricultural company. We focused on soil microbiology and we had a, uh, a lab. And I remember being on the phone and actually trying to talk people out of buying one of our lab tests, right? Because as you were talking to them, they, they didn't know why they were buying the test, really. They were mm -hmm. going to get these results, but then not really know what to do with it, right? 
So it, it didn't make sense because they're going to end up spending, you know, their time and effort excluded about $150 on this information that was going to do nothing for them. And so, you know, you really focus down on saying, why do you want to take this measurement? And it needs to be to drive behavior, right? Mm -hmm. So when you get the results, whatever metric it is you choose to measure, that if it's going to drive behavior, then it it is maybe that's a good indicator that it's it's helpful. That is, if you get results A, you take actions A. Results B, you're going to take actions B. If your actions are going to be the same, regardless of what that metric is, time, energy, effort, wasted. Very well said. I, I, I've got uh, a very recent analogy. Some of you know I missed the tweet chat last week because I was in the emergency room <laughs> and uh, having a, a, a gallbladder, gallbladder attack and uh, the next day emergency surgery to take it out. So, wow. uh, of course, x-rays, CAT scan, um, ultrasound, blood tests, all these things going on to find out, and I'm glad they did those things, all right, first of all, is this an obstruction? Is this an aneurysm in this guy's gut that could kill him here in a few mi minutes? Because I'm you know, crying like a baby on a gurney and uh, with tears streaming down my eye because it was so, so painful. But they were, they were measuring things, right? So when they took the test, they came back, they looked at the results, they looked at the wow. metrics, then decided what had to be done. And you know, so, uh, so, so I'm alive today. So they got the re I, got the, I got the results that uh, maybe didn't weren't the most desirable, but certainly what I needed. Hey, I noticed over there on the side, uh, Lou says, uh, excellent chat tonight as a policeman, couldn't help think about police ticket quotas <laughs> during the whole hour. I'd love to hear more about that, Lou. Come on and, uh, and take a seat. Uh, I got pulled over by a Texas state trooper last Sunday, and it's the first time I've been pulled over uh, in years and years, I haven't gotten a ticket in in decades. Haven't and, been caught. And I was I, I didn't say that I haven't exceeded the speed <laughs> limit. Uh, my policy is to keep it below ten miles an hour over, which I violated uh, last Sunday and got pulled over going eighty two in a seventy uh, mi uh, mile per hour zone. Fortunately, uh, Lou, maybe he already had his quota because I ended up with just a verbal warning not even a, a written warning. So I appreciate that. So this thing about quotas, would love, love to hear more about that. So the question now uh, that we threw out in the chat is, can you measure everything that matters? Do you need to measure everything that matters? Hmm. Uh, it was uh, intriguing, the, the response. Is that a trick question, David, that you came up with? <laughs> well, not a trick question necessarily, <laughs> but, you know, it's, we started, the chat started by everybody saying, yes, absolutely, leaders need to measure and you've got to know what success looks like and, and have the feedback to be able to, to go that direction. And then when we asked the question about whether you can measure everything that matters or not, people started coming up with things like respect and love and integrity and honesty and loyalty and, and things that definitely are important, but measuring them becomes a lot more difficult. And so there's there may or may not be a paradox there, but that was one of the thing, reasons I wanted to throw it out was to get people's thoughts on that. And I'm, I'm curious what, uh, what you all think. Scott, got an answer? Uh, Somebody else want to come in and yeah, take a seat let's, here? Let's leave it open. I don't want to. I, uh, you know, one of my answers was, well, you could, um, you know, you could measure everything if you wanted to, but you might then get away from your vision and your mission as the company. I mean, is that your job to simply measure everything? Uh, that may keep you from actually achieving what it is that you set out to achieve in the long run. Mm -hmm. So I would think to uh, for anyone, whether it's a small business owner to a large corporation, choose the few important things that it is to measure. I mentioned in the tweet chat, and I've got a background work, working for a Fortune 15 company. We had a dashboard on our workstation. And it, it, right. it measured what the company wanted to measure to make mm -hmm. sure that I was producing the results that a person in my position, the company, you know, chose. And I was measured in quintiles. So it was performance ranked and I hated it. 
but it was the way that the company had been doing things for decades and, and they're still doing it, mm -hmm. uh, still doing it that, that way. You can measure everything, but uh, I think that the most important thing is, is if, you're, if your people are happy and you focus on, on helping those that work for you uh, to really find purpose and meaning of what they're doing and make them happy, I think you'll find the numbers are going to be pretty good. And Scott said it well, too, when he was saying that, you know, it's measuring the things that are going to produce behavior and what behaviors matter. So maybe that's a, a to work backwards to, yeah, you're absolutely right. You can measure a thousand different things, none of which are meaningful or are tangentially meaningful. But typically, almost any kind of business, any job that we're doing, there are somewhere between two to five key things that we can do that are going to produce the, the results we're looking for. And those are the things to keep an eye on. And people can't concentrate on more indicators in that anyhow. Hey, Lou. Hey, yes, there's Lou. Uh, and Lou, Catherine, Lou, Catherine Lou. had a, a comment too on the side. Let me just bring that up. She says, every metric drives a behavior and you need to think, is it a behavior that you want or is it misaligned with what you're trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a great story um, from Edwards Deming um, talking about a, a particular shirt factory where they were given quotas. They had to make so many shirts of each of so many sizes within their eight hour shift. But the machine uh, could make those shirts, but to retool it, to change it from mm -hmm. large to medium and medium to small took a certain amount of time. So the physical capacity of the tool was no longer capable of reaching the goal. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, the people were being measured on, you have to meet this goal or you will be fired, essentially. So uh, it turns out changing the labels took almost no time. So when they went from large <laughs> to medium, they changed the labels. There you go. That's a perfect example of gaming the system as opposed to being able to play. Absolutely. It. Yeah. So the system will uh, produce what it's designed to produce. So in this case, it was mislabeled shirts. <laughs> so just just to go on with uh, Catherine's comment there. I'm curious how Lou would respond with the quotas and so on we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Hey, Lou, good to see you. Yeah. Introduce yourself. Let's Tell us what's on your mind. Wind you up here. Yeah, my name is Lou. I'm a policeman in the Chicago area. I do a handful of uh, leadership and uh, human development uh, consulting on the side. So when I saw the metrics, it, the first thing that pops into my mind is ticket quotas because it's been such a hot topic. And when we're dealing with things like traffic safety, which is a component of public safety, which is a component to policing in the community, we start to measure the minutia of the numbers of tickets and stops and, and, and enforcement when in fact some of that stuff incentivizes really poor community policing and responsiveness mm -hmm. to the community. Right. So mm -hmm. some of the some of the tweets that I saw were dealing about government issues that aren't uh, profit driven. We're dealing with uh, charitable organizations, the uh, and that was really uh, that really rang true for me. What do you think, Lou? From a healthy perspective, what kind of if 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 you could, you know, in a perfect world. What would be the two or three things that you think would be ideal as outcomes and things to look at? Well, one of the things that uh, there's a group of folks looking at uh, evidence-based policing, and we're starting to look at things by saying, what is the evidence in the effectiveness of enforcement and tickets based on traffic safety? So what should we be measuring instead of just an officer's, uh, you know, numerical uh, enforcement, you know, the, the numbers of tickets and stops? So shouldn't we be measuring things like fatalities and severity and uh, types of crashes uh, on our roadways instead of what the officer is doing? I mean, maybe we should be re-engineering roadways. Maybe we should be spending more of our efforts on education or just mere presence. Maybe those things are actually more of, of a deterrent in, in unsafe driving than writing tickets. You know, I think that's a great example uh, here in Austin, Texas, uh, this uh, this last year, they instituted a new law that you could not have. Uh, you can't text while driving. You, you can't even have a smartphone laying on the seat. You can't even use it for uh, navigation unless it's uh, somehow fixed to uh, to the dashboard. And we know that texting 
is a major distraction, and I'm sure it's cost a lot of lives. What I've heard, though, in some initial studies, not only here but in other places that have instituted that particular law, that they've actually seen accidents go up because now people are hiding their phones down in their lap, oh, and no. so they're actually looking down for a longer period of time while sending a text than they were when they were able to hold it up. You know, it's sort of look look while they're driving. Sometimes the unintended consequences uh, can, you know, can come into play there. Not only regarding laws, but uh, I would think regarding metrics. David, would you say that so? Unintended consequences yeah. of maybe uh, a focus on the wrong metrics or giving that wrong signal, like like the shirts we were saying a moment ago, that just sort of uh, creates chaos. Oh yeah, it's a classic in the. <clears throat> You know, in the literature, and there's so many different examples you can come with. Anytime you put so much focus and weight on a measurement, if there's any alternative way to achieve that measurement, that drives people's behavior. And it's it's so common that, uh, that you come up with so many examples. I love the shirt, the label changing. I've, I've seen in human mm -hmm. service organizations where when you put emphasis on what people are doing with the clients, oftentimes the caseworkers will start working with fewer clients because they don't want their numbers to suffer. And that's not the desired outcome. You, you see it in all different sorts of ways. Right. Well, I was in financial services, so they were measuring you know, revenue that I was generating from clients, which if I were to focus only on generating revenue and not on the needs of the clients uh, that I was serving, might be serving what the company wanted, but it really wasn't perhaps something that was best for the client. And that could lead in, uh, in an industry like financial services where people are only you know, chasing the dollar and actually taking advantage of clients. And that would be a tremendous uh, unintended, unintended consequence. Well, here's so, a, a great example that you know, we mentioned in the book that, that I think everybody can identify with. If you've been in almost any big box retailer in the last year, you've probably had a, cash, a cashier hand you a receipt and circle a survey and give it to you and say, please fill out this survey and then beg you with language, something along the lines of, if I get anything less than a 10 on this, <laughs> I get marked down, right? And so that's, it's it, it's behavior that has nothing to do with the actual desired outcomes. And it's, it's just producing, gaming the system as opposed to anything that re remotely resembles customer service. I was in another town, walked into a Kmart. I didn't even know Kmart still existed. I thought... I thought they were uh, perhaps gone because they disappeared. You just, you just lost your sponsor for the, the tweet chat, right? Uh, yeah, well, that's okay. Uh, so when I walked up to the cashier, I must have been asked five questions. Do you want to sign up for this? You know, would would you like to be a member of this? Would you? you know, I mean, there was there was there was at least five different questions that I that I was asked before mm -hmm. I was able to purchase the product. And it sounded like a, a company that was desperate to try to find ways to, to reach out to clients. And it was a very, you know, it was a very off-putting uh, experience, uh, sure. to put it mildly. I almost felt like I was being uh, attacked and interrogated right there before, uh, before I could make, uh, 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 make a purchase. So uh, next to the last question up here, how can you keep the metrics that matter most in front of people? So what are ways, uh, David mm -hmm. or, or Scott, that you've seen uh, that uh, metrics can be kept in, in, in front of um, in front of folks. Scott, you want to take a shot? Well, I was just thinking back to a, um, a particular bank that I worked for that I think was effective in driving the behavior that they wanted in the sales on um, on the sales platform. Um, so you know they're selling loans and different types of accounts and uh, those typical bank products. And they had a, a very simple system that used, a, a, you know, an NCR type multi-page form to track your, basically your activity in your sales. And um, you could go to any one of the salespeople and they'd be able to you could say, hey, Dan, you know, what's your commission for this, uh, you know, for so far this month? And they could pull out those, their sheets and tabulate pretty quickly. Uh, it, uh, it, uh, cut off on the 25th of the month. They got a report at the end of the month and then they got their check on, on the 15th of the month. Right. Mm -hmm. So it was 
So in this case, it was very timely mm -hmm. uh, reporting. And one of the things that, you know, have you ever gone into a bank and you need some service and there's two people, one of them is sitting with, uh, you know, with a customer and the other person is on the phone and they see you standing there. So now it's a race to see who can stretch out that conversation longer so that the other person has to, has to service them, right? Mm -hmm. So they're just like, oh, okay, David, we, uh, we talked about your account today and how it's going to benefit your children and blah, 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 you know. Kind of stretching on. They're on the phone. On okay. Now let me see. Let me check your address again, because uh, Dan, I need to mail this out to you, right? <clears throat> but when they had this system, I was in a branch, and a customer comes in the front door, and they start to walk toward the sales platform, and I watched the person get up and actually knock over their chair because they were in. They knew what the incentive was. You know, they knew that the average. You know, this is for a person making a little above minimum wage. They knew that the average person walking in was worth like 30 bucks in commissions to them just on the on the new accounts platform. So in this case, they were they, they had a specific behavior that they were driving and and it was reported in a very timely manner. But the person could also track it themselves and validate it. So it wasn't a, a really complex system that required metrics from other departments and cooperation from other areas. It was very clean, very simple. And Scott, I think you're getting at so much of what's important when we're talking about keeping measurements in front of people is that it's simple, that there's right. two to five things. It's not many. It's enough that we can keep track of it. I think the transparency issue that you just uh, cited is critical when it's done well, whether you're talking about managing your own budget or anything else, is it timely? Can the person track it themselves or does it take an arcane way of, you know, right. working through exactly. the black box? And then I think another uh, aspect of it is, and this this was uh, uh, referred to in the tweet chat, is that data takes interpretation. I think Zachary was mentioning that uh, early on, is that data takes interpretation. And so one of the models that I've tried to live by is there's a story for every number and a number for every story so that we're humanizing any kind of measurement that we're using and that anything that we're coming at from a human perspective, we're also doing it in associated quantitative ways so that we're getting the full story and not leaving it to chance of people making up their own interpretations or not understanding why something matters. And I love the way you were talking about the simplicity and transparency. I think that's very powerful. Another example comes to my mind from my uh, recent emergency room experience. I've been seeing these billboards the last few years, you know, emergency room wait time, 14 yes. minutes, uh, 17 minutes. And I thought, man, that's great. The last time I took somebody's emergency room, it was hours. So, you know, what, what's going on? So I went to the emergency room on Monday and this particular hospital has uh, a goal of uh, uh, of seeing you within 30 minutes. So I come in, I check in at a window and I am seated. And then I'm called to another little room in just a few moments and basically triage, which is what they used to do when they saw you at the first window. You know, are you having a heart attack? Are you bleeding? You know, uh, what's happening? Then I sat for an hour and 45 minutes before, <laughs> before I came, they was, checked you in. was taken back into, you know, the emergency room area. But they met their goal yeah. of seeing me within within 30 minutes. The other thing that, that uh, uh, the airlines do is, yes. on, you know, on time departures. If they can pull away from the gate on time. That's an on-time departure. It doesn't matter if you wait an the hour tarmac. out there yeah. before yeah. the plane <laughs> takes off. So, well, and you saw that you saw that too with airlines where they extended all of the flight times. They actually to improve their on-time arrivals. They just buffered everything, added half an hour, forty-five minutes a couple of years ago to all the flight times. <laughs> so, so these are examples of, of yeah. metrics gone wrong. Metrics that that start yeah. out with a good intention, uh, mm -hmm. but they're misused, misapplied, or misinterpreted. Uh, and, and, and I think that that happens a lot. <laughs> it does. It's human nature. It's one, it's why it's a trap. It's why I wanted to bring it up tonight. Cause it's something every one of us can fall into very readily. Well, listen, um, wanted to limit this to, uh, to 30 minutes tonight. So again, uh, thank you, uh, uh, 
uh, Scott for coming on the show here and David Guy for uh, being my guest in the Lead with Giants uh, tweet chat this evening. And our topic was metrics madness. And I'm going to put that in the box here as the topic one last time because when I stop the recording, it will uh, that that will be the title that's given to it. The Lead with Giants tweet chat every Monday, 6 p.m. Central Time, which is 7 p.m. Eastern Time and what is that over there specific time, Scott? 4 p.m.? Uh, if, yeah, 4 p.m. for the tweet chat. Yeah, okay. I just asked <laughs> figure, figure it out for themselves. So uh, let me stop the recording again. Thank you, everyone, for joining Leave a Giants. Thank you, Dan. David. Thank you for sharing.